This is African American History is American History. Welcome. I'm your host, Harlan Kearsley. This program's goal is to foster understanding, promote discussion, and expand knowledge through stories of historical events, bios of unsung heroes, as well as timely and relevant news stories which hopefully will paint a vivid picture of the effects of segregation, discrimination, and bigotry on the lives of both blacks and whites. Comparisons will be made between the many racially fractured periods of American history and what's going on right now. Sarah Rector was born on March 3rd, 1902, near the all-black town of Taft, Oklahoma, on what was then known as Indian Territory. At the age of only 11, Sarah Rector became an oil baron. By the age of 12, she was getting marriage proposals on a daily basis from men both black and white. Sarah Rector became so wealthy that the Oklahoma legislature actually declared her to be, wait for it, a white person. White newspapers, both domestic and international, began referring to her as the richest colored girl in the world. This is her story. It's funny. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about my life before I came into all this money. I learned over the years that money will make you rich and comfortable, but it still won't make you free, especially if you're black. My parents were both born in 1881, Joseph and Rose Rector. They were both African descendants of Creek Indians, and both of their fathers fought with the Union Army during the Civil War. I had six brothers and sisters, Roy, Rosa, Lily, Rebecca, Joe Jr., and Lou. We all lived in a two-room cabin near Twine, Oklahoma, on Muskegee Creek Indian Allotment Land through the Dawes Act of 1887, which authorized the President of the United States to subdivide Creek lands among the Creeks and their former slaves. My parents, my brothers and sisters, we all received a small parcel of land, but the land granted to former slaves were usually rocky and of poorer agricultural quality. The more fertile land was reserved for white settlers. My allotment of 160 acres was valued at $556.50. To say we were poor would be an understatement. In order to make enough money to pay the $30 annual property tax, my father leased my allotment to the Standard Oil Company. That was in February of 1911. By 1913, they hired an independent oil driller, B.B. Jones, to drill wells on the property, and he produced. A gusher. A gusher is a daggum gusher. What does that mean? <laughs> Why, little missy, it means you're going to be one rich color gal. That one well produced 2,500 barrels of oil a day. And at 11 years old, I started receiving a daily income of $300. And remember, this was 1913. So in today's dollars, that would be over $7,000. <laughs> the other wells on my property were just as productive. And by my 12th birthday... I was receiving royalties of $11,567. Again, that would be just over $284,000 in today's money. The Denver Star. A Negro girl's income is the highest in the entire state of Oklahoma. The news about my newfound wealth seemed to spread worldwide. I was receiving requests for newspaper interviews, banks were lining up to beg me to trust my money with them, and people I didn't even know were asking me for loans. I even received marriage proposals from four white men from Germany. Kansas City Star. 
oil made picking any rich. An Oklahoma girl with $15,000 a month gets many marriage proposals. Four white men from Germany want to marry the Negro child that they might share her fortune. Apparently to them, my being black and only 12 years old took a back seat to my being incredibly rich. As I was underage, my parents were my legal guardians and handled my financial affairs. That is, until I struck it rich. We quickly found out that there was a law at the time that required all full-blooded Indians, black adults, and children who were citizens of the Indian Territory to be assigned a white guardian. Funny. This law only applied to those Indians and blacks that came into a significant sum of money. Standard Oil put pressure on my father to hand his guardianship over to a local white resident named T.J. Porter. The Ottumwa Tri-Weekly Courier. The 12-year-old Negro girl is under sympathetic guardianship. J.T. Porter promises the girl will receive the best education of which she is capable. We were assured that he was a well-respected man, with only my best interest in mind. At least, that's what we were told. The first thing T.J. Porter did was contact the Oklahoma legislature to have me declared a legal white person. That way, I would be allowed to travel in first-class accommodations as was befitting my newfound wealth and position. As word spread of my wealth, I was making headlines around the world. But the truth was, J.T. Porter was robbing me blind. But I had no idea my estate was being mismanaged, or that I wasn't living or dressed in the style of a woman with my wealth. <laughs> This is African American History's American History. The Chicago Defender soon came to my rescue. At that time, the Chicago Defender was the country's most influential black newspaper. In 1914, they published an article calling out my white guardian. The story caught the attention of both Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. They contacted my parents and offered to help improve my situation. Soon lawyers from the NAACP got involved, not only to improve my rights, but the rights of all black children in my situation. W.E.B. Du Bois wanted to make sure my situation was never repeated, so he created a children's department at the NAACP. The department investigated claims of white guardians mistreating black children around the country. James C. Waters, Jr. was the Children's Department's lead agent. He worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the U.S. Children's Bureau to correct the mismanagement of my estate and have J.T. Porter removed as my guardian. After seeing firsthand my situation, he quickly wrote to W.E.B. Du Bois. Dear Dr. Du Bois, This is to inform you of the growing concerns I and other members of the NAACP have regarding the mismanagement of young Sarah Rector's estate. The child is clearly being taken advantage of by her white financial guardian, who holds neither Miss Rector nor her family with any regard whatsoever. I have also apprised the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the United States Children's Bureau of my concerns. Is it not possible to have her cared for in a decent manner and by people of her own race instead of by a member of a race which would deny her and her kind the treatment accorded a good yard dog? Any advice you can render would be most Welcome. Sincerely, James C. Waters, Jr., Special Agent for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Booker T. Washington also helped. In October of 1914, I was enrolled in the children's school, 
a boarding school at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. It was headed by Mr. Washington. When I turned 18, I left Tuskegee, and on March 3rd, 1920, I moved my entire family to Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> I always wanted to see Kansas City, and now I had the means to see it in style. I owned stocks and bonds, a boarding house, a bakery, and I moved my family into what is still referred today as the Rector Mansion. When I was 20, I married a local Kansas City businessman, Kenneth Campbell. Kenneth had a Hupmobile dealership on 19th and Vine. The wedding was bittersweet because just two months earlier, my father passed. I was looking forward to him walking me down the aisle. Anyway, the wedding was a very private affair. Only my mother and Kenneth's grandmother on his father's side were in attendance. The press, who for some reason was still obsessed with me, reported that our wedding was extravagant. It wasn't. The press loved to report on my spending. They said I had quite a taste for fine clothing and fast cars. And you know something? They were right. <laughs> I enjoyed my wealth. And yes, I was frequently stopped by the police for speeding. I believe that just about every officer in Kansas City at one time or another had given a speeding ticket to that rich colored gal with the fast cars, which are way too expensive for someone of her race to have. <laughs> and even though Kansas City at that time was segregated, my money seemed to magically lift those barriers. Jacquard's was a very high-end jewelry store that was closed to Negroes. But those doors swung open wide for me, or rather, for my money. I would literally stroll into white establishments, often and without any trouble. The Jim Crow laws in Missouri at that time said Negroes couldn't use fitting rooms to try on clothing before purchasing. But I did, and I never had a problem. Because those high-end store owners didn't see black. They only saw green. I also hosted many elegant dinner parties at my home. Many leading members of the black community were there. Some of the guests are names you all would probably know even today. Celebrities like Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Joe Lewis, and Jack Johnson. Kenneth and I had three sons, Kenneth Jr., Leonard and Clarence. When they were of school age, I found out that many of the black children in the neighborhood weren't allowed on the buses and were forced to walk miles to school. So I had my chauffeur drive my children along with others in the neighborhood to and from school. In 1928, Kenneth partnered with Homer Roberts, an auto dealership out of Chicago. It was an opportunity to expand his business by tapping into a bigger and wealthier Negro market. Roberts Campbell Motors was only the second Negro-owned auto dealership in the country. Things were looking great, that is, until 1929, when the Depression hit. It was like a punch in the face. Everything just stopped. All my investments went south. Kenneth lost the Kansas City dealership. He moved to Chicago to try and keep Roberts Campbell Motors from going under as well. He couldn't, and by 1930, we were divorced. Kenneth took the two older children to live with him in Chicago. As I watched my fortune disappear, I was forced to sell most of my real estate holdings, as well as my mansion in Kansas City, and move to a much smaller home. In 1932, I sold my parcel of land back in Oklahoma. All I could get for it was $100. In 1934, I remarried. William A. Crawford was a baker who owned his own restaurant on 18th and Vine here in Kansas City. He was a good man. And I knew he loved me for me and not for my money. <laughs> Cause I didn't have any more money.
Then, in 1940, the Kansas City Police Department called to inform me that my son Kenneth Jr. had been gunned down and killed by a white man. I was at a point where I thought I would be facing nothing but heartache, poverty, and despair for the rest of my life. Then, in 1946, the Indian Claims Commission held hearings about how the government had stolen tribal lands. They found widespread misuse and fraud, and restitution was ordered to all who had their land taken from them. By 1950, I received a hefty settlement from the government, and with that money, I bought a small farm just east of Overland Park. It's only a few miles from Kansas City. My children grew up and eventually moved away, but they often spent weekends with me here on the farm. Oh, and I still maintained a fine stable of fast cars. <laughs> In 1967, Sarah Rector suffered a stroke, and on July 22nd of that year, Sarah Rector Campbell Crawford died in the Kansas City General Hospital. Her wake was held at the Kerford Funeral Home, which just happened to be the building formerly known as the Rector Mansion. Her relatives escorted her back to Oklahoma, where she was buried in the city of Taft's Black Jack Cemetery. And at the age of 65, Sarah Rector was laid to rest next to her parents. This has been African American History's American History. The episode you've been listening to, Sarah Rector, the richest colored girl in the world, was written and directed by Harlan Kearsley. The actors for this episode included... Jeffrey Schubert as B.B. Jones and the Kansas City Star Reporter. Crystal Williamson as the Ottumwa Tri-Weekly Courier Reporter. Robert McKay as NAACP Special Agent James C. Waters Jr. And Soraya Butler as Sarah Rector. I'm Harlan Kearsley, and on behalf of everyone here at African American History is American History. Thank you for listening. And if you haven't done so, please take a second to click the red subscribe button below. Once you do, you'll be notified as soon as new episodes are posted. Thanks again, and please, stay safe. African American History is American History. Copyright H.C. Kearsley, 2020.